Welcome to European History with Dr. Brovkin, AP European History. Uh, today we continue to talk about 18th century France. Last time we discussed the system of John Law, economic development of France, the establishment of banking and credit. Uh, today we will talk about social structure in France, the uh, most important two estates, that of nobility and the clergy. So, so that's the today's topics. Uh, so it produces new system of credit, new system of banking, uh, and uh, fast economic development. Now let us look at uh, France's uh, social system and social uh, structure. So uh, uh, at this time, and pretty much throughout the century, France had a population of 19 million people. 19 million Frenchmen are divided into three estates. And this is crucial for understanding because of the French Revolution would be same kind of a setup and same kind of problems, only worse. Uh, so the first estate uh, is, nobility, is uh, clergy, and I'll come back to it later, but now I'd like to speak about nobility. So uh, French nobility is 400,000 people, uh, and of those is about 80,000 families. And there's two parts of it, nobility of the sword, epée, and nobility of the robe. Uh, nobility of the uh, sword is the traditional nobility. That these are the grandsons of, of uh, uh, people who rebelled in, uh, in, in uh, Fronde. Uh, these are big uh, landed owners who are resentful of Louis XIV uh, and who basically resent the power of the king. Uh, as you will see when we study Montesquieu, who was one of them, who was the a, a, a chair president of, uh, of um, uh, the Parlement in Bordeaux. Uh, he basically said that, that characterizes the view of big nobility of the king, that the king uh, made clowns out of the French nobility, that he diminished, uh, dim diminished their power, he ridiculed them, made them into useless servants. So it shows the kind of a displeasure and a discontent of the big nobility in regard to the king. Uh, now, the nobility get a tenth of income uh, of their peasants. Uh, sometimes it would be higher if you add to it not just free labor or money uh, in, forms of, in, in terms of rent that they pay to the landlords. But if uh, there's on top of it, there's more that they pay for the use of forests and for the use of bridges and for the use of hunting and all kinds of privileges here and there. And, and in some cases, uh, it goes up to about 15% uh, of their um, of peasants' um, uh, income goes to the landlord. Uh, so now nobility uh, of the sword, some of them are super rich. Uh, they have huge estates uh, and they do not pay taxes. So this is one of the two estates that pays no taxes. Uh, but some of them are quite poor uh, and they are they have a village or two and they barely make ends meet and they basically go poorer and poorer and sometimes are indistinguishable from the local peasants and all they have is a title. Uh, so this is a brief overview of the uh, nobility of the sword. Nobility of the, uh, nobility of the robe is, is a little more complex because it's very diverse. Uh, so let's remind us who are the nobility of the robe. These are intendants. These are people who have been created to collect taxes by Colbert. Uh, and some of them become uh, extraordinary rich. And some of them actually use the, the jobs for enrichment uh, and uh, uh, invest money. So they become very similar to British nobles in the sense that they are money people. A lot of them become bankers, and two of the most famous ones, by the way, we shall study, Elvetius and Olba, who were bankers and who were philosophers and who wrote uh, books that were pretty much the foundation stone of the French Revolution. So this is a very interesting class. They are kind of uh, nascent bourgeoisie in a Marxist sense, but they don't live in the villages. They 
uh, I mean, in the, in the cities, they are landowners but, and clerks in the government. But they do sponsor uh, enlightenment. They contribute money to the philosophs. Uh, they're educated, they're thinking individuals, uh, and they are very much uh, politically engaged. A lot of times they are in the parlement, a provincial parlement, uh, and the, a lot of times they are like the big nobility, dislike the king uh, and autocracy. And, and more and more of them are the reading public uh, of the philosophes and of those who will undermine the regime. Theology is the first estate. And there's 260,000 of them in 1668, and 420,000 in 16, uh, sorry, in 1715, and even more, 192,000 in 1662, uh, in the years closer to the revolution. So that means that they're growing. Uh, amazingly, the progress should have kind of reduced their number, but they're not. Uh, they're actually uh, increasing. Uh, of those, there were 18 uh, archbishops, 109 bishops, 40,000 priests, 50,000 assistant priests, and 100,000 monks and nuns. So it's a huge number. Uh, they had 740 monasteries. And the monasteries are really pretty much business enterprises. Monasteries uh, have collect dues from peasants and invest those dues and, and growing vineyards. It's a huge. It's the richest class in France. It's the smallest in terms of numbers. Uh, and it is the richest by far. Now, its riches are based on the tenth. They collect another tenth from the peasants, like the landlords. But on top of it, they make a lot of money on all kinds of procedures, such as you pay the money when you, when you want a prayer for somebody's soul. Uh, you pay the money for marriage. You pay the money for birth registration and for death registration. So they control the uh, spiritual uh, life in a village, and they basically uh, charge money for everything, and they do not pay taxes. So they, all this business that they do is completely tax-free. And as I mentioned before, sometimes they pay to the king uh, a kind of a gratuity, so a gift that they do on their own, uh, but they never really pay the taxes. Uh, now, most bishops are sons, second sons of big nobility, so that not to break up the estates, they, they, they pass them on, like in England, to the firstborn, and then the second born becomes bishops. What does it mean? It means that a lot of these bishops are not really religious people who do it because of their calling that they want to serve Jesus Christ. They do it because that's a lucrative job uh, that you can have uh, and have a lot of money that comes with it through the uh, collection of various payments and fees that these bishops have. Just like the landlords, they collect corvée, which is unpaid labor from peasants, dues, payments, uh, and they are the strongest and the richest power in France. Um, uh, and last thing is, in 1749, the Minister of uh, Finance uh, under Louis XV, Marchaud, tried to impose a 5% tax. Now, this is important, because if it had worked, it may have prevented the French Revolution. Uh, because the French Revolution, like the American one, was over taxes uh, and over unfair taxes. But, but they, they rebelled. They basically forced the king to abolish it by giving him a bribe in the, force of, in the shape of a voluntary contribution, uh, and that tax had to be removed. So essentially, the king is afraid. Who is the king afraid of? The king is afraid of the church because he feels that uh, the foundation of social order. He's afraid of peasants, and what he believes, the only power that can hold the masses in check would be the church, by fear of punishment and sin and hell and all the rest of it. The king needs the church as an institution of social control. But for that social control, they want to be free from taxes, and they have this huge business going on, which is tax-free. Uh, the king is also afraid of big nobility, and big nobility dislikes the king. Uh, a lot of them are uh, sponsoring and 
joining the philosophes in their writings against the king. Uh, and another suspicious class, of course, as I just said, are the notaries and the educated society. Uh, many of them are noble. Who will be the consumers of this literature? Who will be the ones buying encyclopedia and the writings of Diderot and Rousseau and Voltaire? So that's the kind of a political climate and social structure that will uh, that will bring France to a revolution. Thank you. And don't forget, tell your friends to subscribe to AP European History with Dr. Brovkin and to put their likes and to subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>